60. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I'm Professor Paul Daly of the University of Ottawa, where I hold the University Research Chair in Administrative Law and Governance. Um, and today we are kicking off the 2023 Administrative Law and Governance Colloquium. The topic for this year's edition is the legitimacy of the state. The legitimacy of contemporary liberal democratic states is in a state of flux, managing the effects of globalization, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and fighting escalating inflation have prompted serious questions about public administration in the global north. These pressing issues have shone a spotlight on difficult areas for liberal democracies, which have struggled in recent decades to reconcile popular desires with the need for effective governance. In this year's Administrative Law and Governance Colloquium, speakers will address challenges to legitimacy in liberal democratic states by focusing on a range of institutions, the executive branch, the civil service, administrative agencies, <laughs> immigration enforcement, and central banks. The overall goal of the series is to outline contemporary legitimacy challenges and likely responses. And I'm very happy to have as this year's first guest, uh, Professor Margaret Cohn, who is a professor in law at the Faculty of Law, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and the Henry J. and Fanny Harkavy Chair in Comparative Law. Previously the Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and Chair of the Advanced Studies Committee, her research interests include comparative public law, the executive branch in theoretical and comparative contexts, law and society, and the interface between law and politics. Alongside many publications in peer-reviewed journals, she is the author of a theory of the executive branch, tension and legality, which you'll be discussing today, general powers of the executive branch and energy law in Israel. Uh, Professor Cohn, the, the floor is yours. Uh, you have uh, as long as you want uh, to present uh, on your wonderful and important book. Um, and afterwards, uh, we'll, of course, have a period of questions and discussion. Over to you. Right, thank you very much for your very kind invitation. I'm delighted to participate. I apologize, I'll be croaking, coughing, using the tissues. I'm just getting out of a bad bout of flu, but at least it's not COVID. So um, you'll, have to, uh, you'll have to suffer this. It's not fair, I only, for only me to suffer, you know, that's the way it goes. Okay, I'm going to uh, present using my PowerPoint, now I need to do the share, just a second. Now what? Gosh, it was here before. Hmm? Okay, one moment. Share. We tried this early to spread. <coughs> This is going to be a lot of fun. It, it always works fine in the green room uh, beforehand, and I can <coughs> confirm that uh, we did have a very successful test. Um, yeah. So let me see what's going on. Just a second. <coughs> okay. <coughs> oh, dear. One second, I just have to find my way around this. Here we go. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. Okay. Nope. Push. Where is it now? Okay, now I will minimize it and now go back. Keep your fingers crossed, <coughs> this should work. Ah, there it is. Okay, right, okay. Um, right, so this is the title, this is me. 
as uh, Paul kindly um, described. Oh, what I want to do is first ask ourselves, not me, because I'm I don't I didn't do Canadian Canadian constitutional law, <coughs> not yet, but we we usually open by asking. Oh, it's getting worse. I haven't talked in about <laughs> five days. <clears throat> hmm. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I usually start my talk with the question of the relative power of a head of government. At this, in this example, of course, we're talking about the Canadian Prime Minister. <clears throat> I need you guys to ask yourselves what is the relative power of Justin Trudeau? You could also look at this affair and ask <laughs> yourself, um, has Prime Minister Trudeau <clears throat> overstepped his powers or not? I'm not going to answer this question, <clears throat> but this links with the general claim that I make in, is that heads of the executive branch, it doesn't matter if it's a, a presidential regime or a parliamentary regime, the head of the executive branch is a decisive power in the political structure of any democracy. Now, I won't go into the details. I discussed this a bit in chapter one of the book. So I will start by addressing the sub subtitle of all this series, and that is legitimacy. I'll be I'll be connecting my the work in my book, which does not refer to legitimacy, with the term of leg of. <coughs> With this concept, and we can ask ourselves, how would we define legitimacy? I'm not going to go delve very deeply, but uh, what I did actually was now what? Ah, there are different. Uh, I, so I, I started, I usually like to start with some with some uh, cartoons. Um, uh, and the third one has li very little to do <coughs> with what we're discussing, but hey, I thought it was nice. Um, so if I want to identify, I will just use one very basic um, definition um, uh, by Carl Friedrich from the 1960s where he identifies legitimacy with whether a given ruler is believed to be based on good title by most men that are subject to it. Okay, there's a lot that we can discuss, men, et cetera, good title, what is that, belief. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we got a general idea um, and my aim is to link what I see as the main aspect of executive branches in the in democratic states with the concept of legitimacy. So there. First of all, an essential condition for legitimacy would be, let's say I could use the fuzzy term, the rule of law, but I will just <coughs> um, refer to the existence of clear and accessible rules that enable the public to plan ahead. So we need that, but do we really get it? Which is what I started working on when I decided to write a more general theory of the executive branch. So, indeed, some rules we know are clear and are consistently applied but very often the rules are different. Some of them result from a real necessity because <coughs> the public sphere must have 
grants of power to the executive branch, but it must also have restraints on the exercise of this power. This creates an irresolvable tension that impacts on the lucidity of law, which I'm going to further develop in the next few minutes when I'm not coughing. So, first of all, I was quite surprised when I started out that there was very limited general study of executive powers. Of course, <clears throat> there's a lot of study on executive powers in specific systems, most notably presidential studies in the United States, but nothing that I could find that gave us a general idea. It's not comparative, it's more of, of a general theory, apart from our usual discussion of the separation of powers, etc. So that was quite surprising. I wanted to contribute to this. It's actually growing a little bit. And my starting point was also gleaned from the literature that it's very difficult to find a clear um, definition of executive powers. Some political scientists have shown that there are paradoxes here. Sometimes you need to give power, sometimes you need to restrain it. Um, in, in, in some textbooks talking about the puzzle that is the presidency, very strange, nothing really straightforward. Um, but even when it is, a lot <coughs> of the studies were hierarchical, meaning you need to decide who is the stronger player in a system. Is it the Supreme Court? Is this, is this a president or the head of or the prime minister? Is it the court? Who is it? Now, I'm very much against hierarchical accounts, and I do this here as well. Um, as for the normative element of many of those uh, uh, studies, again, all, most of all, almost all of them system based, there's very often a normative aspect to it. Let's see whether it is proper the powers exercised or improper. <coughs> now, I deal with it in the book to a certain extent later at, at, towards the end, but what I first wanted is to create an explanation or a model, not really a theory, but a model, a working model of executive powers, which were the basis, which was the basis of this book. Right. So to start with, I look at two elements of constitutional theorizing in my view. First, we must recognize that constitutional law is built on internal tensions. There'll be obviously there and use the use the regularly discussed tension between uh, enshrined constitutional constitutions that are difficult or maybe impossible to amend on the other on the one hand on the other hand we want people to be able to present their uh, interests and their wishes tension there is another tension i will look here and you could ask you could also look at the tension between courts being given the power to invalidate statutes tension with the fact that they are not elected now there, there'll be also in, in public law, there's a very basic internal tension between the need to grant power and the danger of abuse of power. Now, what I'm saying is here that these internal tensions are irresolvable. As I said, I'm not a hierarchical theorist. <coughs> irresolvable, but you know, life is not very easy or simple. So I'm just recognizing those internal tensions. Obviously, in the context of the, of the pres president or the executive power, we have a clear internal tension by, with, between the need to grant power and the need to restrain it. So I, I just repeat, 
what I'm doing here, once I recognize the existence of an internal tension, I'm not saying that I'm going to solve it or that we can solve it or that we need to solve it. Because if we solve it, I don't know what, the, what kind of regime we are, more of, or more of an autocratic regime than an open-ended, uh, vibrant polity that <coughs> develop, evolves and changes over time. So this was the base, these are the theoretical basis for my uh, continued argument. And um, what I did, and that's still, I think it's chapters two and slightly, a little bit of chapter three, what I reach in the end is what I call the internal tension model, which I already actually revealed what it means of need to power, empower and the need to restrain. But how do we get there? First of all, we need to look at one meaning of the executive, um, being subservient. Easy, very easy, uh, easily explained. If we're talking about the separation of powers principle, obviously the executive is supposed to be subservient to law. <clears throat> to execute the law. And uh, if we want, we can also phrase it through the rule of law. The executive has the power to execute the laws. Now, as we all know, I don't even need to, to explain this, the executive is not, on, uh, not only a subservient to legislation, but when we look at the other model, which is I'll call it here now the imperial executive, under which, in a certain, under several sets of theories, we see the executive as a sort of a CEO managing the state. One group of theories. The other ones are based on the exception. I won't mention, well, I'll just mention Carl Schmidt once, and that's it. Um, Okay, so I can't say this is invalid. The second, um, do we need or do we want to choose between them? Well, there's another option before we go to the internal tension model. And that is what I call a bipolar model. Very well um, reflected in Harvey Mansfield's book where he argues that the executive is ambivalent because he has two rival contrary conceptions. Sometimes <coughs> will be subservient and leaping into view when necessary and appropriate, okay? So under this version, we're talking about a distinct, this, a clear distinction between one mode that is ducking out of sight and the other mode, okay? or peacetime and emergency time. Now, this I think is not only untenable in today's world, but I don't think it's very helpful because it, we need to understand that the executive is both uh, concurrently subservient and dominant. And this is really what I call um, um, uh, uh, internal tension model. Now, the next question is to ask, how does law empower without setting limits, okay? Because if we're talking about this kind of a, of a tension if, and the, the executive is supposed to uh, apply, uh, um, apply law, legislation, but still be dominant over it, is what I call um, fuzzy law, fuzzy legality. Now I'll say what it is and what it isn't. Okay, we have three modes, <coughs> legality, illegality, and illegality. So legality, basically, I don't think I need to explain. Illegality, I'm not interested in. I'm not talking about situation in situations in, when the ex, in which, under which the executive operates contrary to law. A legality would be a situation where there's no question of legality at all. I don't really find that this is a category worth discussing. 
I also explain, I want to emphasize that I'm not talking about soft law, law that is sort of uh, under agreement, being applied, but not enforceable. No, I'm talking about law as fully uh, enforced, um, um, applicable, the grant of power to uh, 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 a government branch. So it's not soft law, it's real law. But the question of legality um, is further developed to show how law can be both uh, granting power uh, with limited constraint. Okay, so just to stop here for a second, I'm talking again of the way law enables exec the executive branch to both act under law, but without any substantive constraint, okay? In this analysis, and we are already in chapter three, I, I identify different types of what I call fuzzy law organized according to their generator. Uh, okay, so this is a, a, a I'll enlarge this in a second. So this has three types of fuzziness. The first constitution generated fuzziness, meaning ways in which constitutions grant the executive powers to act with limited constraint. So there are three types here. I will discuss them all in short. Um, okay, let's start. Um, well, as I said, we're in Canada, so I'm going to give you a few examples from the Constitution, the Canadian Constitution. We're talking about the example of having a constitutions being worded usually in open-ended ways. The text has to be flexible enough to enable action, consist, consist, consistent action of the state. So. Okay, we know, we have we understand that according to um, Article Nine, the executive government is vested in the Queen. There are various other provisions here I won't really deal with. Um, very complicated uh, uh, article in my view, but I want to also mention another very very unique. Um, provision uh, when compared, say, to the United States, because this is the only power that is express, expressly enumerated, although in itself it's a bit open ended. So, what have we here? We have a constitution that is quite open ended. We want, to, if we want to understand what powers does the executive have. We cannot just rely on the constitutional text. It's just the starting point. Um, the same I found in the United States and the United Kingdom in different ways. But the book really is about a general argument plus examples from the United States and the United Kingdom. So in the United States, we have a very open-ended text I'm not going to repeat the whole thing. I'm going to look, by the way, at additional doctrine, okay, beyond the open-ended text. First, a doctrine of sovereignty, at least in one case from the 1930s, the power of the president to act in foreign affairs was grounded in the state's sovereignty, not in the constitutional text. That's Curtis Wright of 1936. Another doctrine is the doctrine of gloss, because there have been several decisions where the courts were ready to read powers into <coughs> existing statutes that did not explicitly empower the executive, but were either were either accommodating to uh, to the um, to the exercise of power. Um, I don't know how, how hmm. well, I could give a couple of uh, examples. I think 
Um, but let me just focus on one. Um, there is a decision from the nine, from 1915. Okay, this has been repeated in, 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 in later decisions where the question was, what is the source of power of the US president to decide to make rules, executive orders that uh, limit temporarily entrance into oil rich lands and uh, authorize it, him also to create um, Native American reserves. Nothing in any statute authorizes the president to do that. What the court found in 1915 in Midwest oil, where there was a long standing practice of presidential declarations of land accepted by Congress, accepted meaning they never, the Congress never refused or never negated this power. This in itself is a gloss over the grant of power. There are quite a few uh, 20th century decisions. The most important one is Midwest, is, is Youngstown versus she, Youngstown Sheet and Cube. Uh, we could discuss this until tomorrow morning, but I won't do that. Okay, so what we have here, I've moved, as you can see, from open-ended texts to non-textual constitutional doctrines in the United States. What do we have in the United Kingdom? I think that you are well aware of the fact that we need to talk about the royal prerogative. Its application in, the, in, in Canada is also an issue we could discuss, but I'm going to be very brief on this one as well. So what we have here is what's been discussed in various contexts as a residuum of power that has a historical basis and has never been legislated against. A residuum meaning that parliament can enact and basically uh, put the prerogative into sleep or kill it altogether. There are various uh, positions on this one. So, okay, fair enough. So we have some of these historically based prerogatives. You can't find them in the constitution. Obviously the United Kingdom doesn't have a written constitution in the way we know it, it is, but obviously this doctrine, constitutional doctrine or convention is well established in the United Kingdom and beyond. All Commonwealth uh, systems may uh, or, sure, or did adopt the royal prerogative. The thing is that the royal prerogative is a, in fact a very limited list of powers. What happens when we have a new issue to deal with, okay? Let's say this is an example that could also work for France, but we're not doing this today. Who has the power to make, uh, make a policy in the, in the context of atomic energy? Now we may have a statute. The statute may authorize um, a certain minister or secretary of state to act, but we may not have a statute in that, in this context. So what we have is some, what, something that has sometimes been called third source powers. Okay, so now we have another category. We have legislative based powers, prerogative powers, and so-called very weird, very unclear third source powers. They have been linked in the UK the, the discussion with what I called personification. I'll explain. Um, this was first discussed in 1978. In this case, um, the question was whether the police could tap phone calls from this man Malone, who was at least suspicious of drug trafficking. Now, there was no statute, so it was argued, that authorized the police to tap phones, okay? 
So now the court had to decide what to do. Is the, is the practice of telephone tapping, which has been going on for decades, more than decades, since the invention of telephone, was this all illegal? illegal? Now, what the court did following uh, the arguments of the state was it, uh, it ruled the following. Um, there is no prohibition against phone tapping in the legislation. Therefore, um, just like anybody else, any, any individual, police, the police could uh, tap phones. Now, this is obviously erron totally erroneous because the powers of government bodies are uh, to be exercised for the general good. And especially when we're talking about the, um, the, uh, the impairing rights, um, there has to be some source of authority. Yeah, in Malone, as late as Malone, the right to privacy was not at all recognized in the UK. Um, so this sort of passed until it went to the European court. But what I want to show is an additional uh, discovery later on uh, that is this memorandum that was actually made in 1945, but only emerged in, the tw in 2003 where the Parliamentary Council opined that a Minister of the Crown has powers as any individual to act unless prohibited, okay? This is very troubling in my view because this is not the way we have to uh, identify government powers. But anyway, if you talk to government uh, ministers and legal advisors, they will strongly uphold this and ask me, what's, what's my problem with, with this kind of, of explanation or indication of legality? Anyway, I totally oppose it. But what we see here is that, as I said, we have the disco discovery of third source powers linked with that idea of personification. Um, and this is one aspect of the ways uh, judicially made doctrines or maybe government made doctrines have been recognized to authorize action. To authorize action in ways that are not clear authorized by statutes which leads us to an interim assessment. If we have such doctrines, they can be, dis they can be discovered by legal advisors, they can be di uh, discovered by courts, etc. This is an upholding of the idea that powers can be granted with no specificity at all. Now, if I link legitimacy with having clear rules, it just doesn't fit. This is why fuzzy legality uh, generated by constitutions creates problem to the issue of legitimacy. Okay, we can move ahead. Now we move to legislature generated fuzzy legality meaning statutes that create, oops, create fuzzinesses. Now, some of them are well known. We all know that any legislative text is open to interpretation, not only <laughs> written constitutions. That's one. Two, we know that many powers, many statutes giving power grant discretion to, author to authorities that are granted power. They can decide in various ways, choose between several alternatives, um, even when there is an obligation to act as discretion as to how to act. Obviously there are authorities to act that are only discretionary, that is there's no duty to 
to um, to apply them. I discuss delegation separately from discretion, although very often we don't see a distinction. Um, because when we have delegation or the ability to delegate, we may reach a situation in which several um, bodies or persons have powers to act in a certain context, which means we will have more fuzziness. We don't know exactly who is going to make the rules because there's a power to delegate. So even if there is a delegation, and they may be, it may be delegated to two or three bodies of authority. So there can be a lot of unclarity and fuzziness in this context. Another, another uh, fourth type has not been really discussed in this context. Let's look at a, at a typical statute where several decision makers are granted the power to make a decision. So it's not only one person who has the authority. I don't want to only look at low level, let's say tax officers, et cetera. Um, but in general, once we have different um, actors that can exercise the power, there's always the possibility, if not the inevitability of clashing decisions, again, leading to fuzziness. What I will discuss a bit further is the fifth type, which I call patchwork legislation. Okay, up to now, we thought that in any context, we have one statute, one legislative mandate, and it orders the field, a single statute where we can find anything we want to find, nowhere else. This sounds very good, but obviously it doesn't reflect reality. So I see two types of patchwork legislation. One is I call piling up and the other is dispersion. In piling up, I mean a practice of legislating, legislating another layer and another layer, et cetera, et cetera, with no real attention to the fact that we have different layers. Some of them can be overlapping. Some of them can be different. Maybe even can be, uh, that there can be a, some kind of a, uh, uh, lost the word together with my coughs. But anyway, this is one example. Dispersion occurs when we don't have one statute or list or, or list of piling up statutes but we have a certain field of action that is, we, in order to understand what the rules are, we have to look into various statutes, not one. The, the typical example of piling up, which is what I've discussed in my, in my book, is emergency legislation. We know that every time, in most systems I know, when there's an emergency, there is some kind of statute but hey, after the emergency occurred and somehow was resolved, there is an understanding that mm -mm, the existing sta sta legislative basis was insufficient and therefore a new statute is added onto um, the existing statute without looking into the question of whether we want to repeal the former arrangement. And dispersion, I use the example of clean air legislation. Uh, I don't know exactly, I'm going to ask you about Canada, but in, in, in my, my overview of clean air legislation in the, in the UK and the US, I show how dispersed the body of legislation is. Now, in both cases, when we have several bases, several legislative bases with no, um, coherence, no necessary, necessary, necessary coherence, we have fuzziness. So let us see. Now, I'm not sure because I, I haven't done too much work on Canada also, although I promise to, uh, to be good and work on in this, 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 in this direction. 
Now, look, the Anti-Terrorism of Act, which you know much better than me, is a collection of amendments to existing statutes. Um, but I'm not sure whether if we look at it today, we say, okay, this is the one and only statute that deals with anti-terrorism uh, measures. If it is the one and only, then I don't know if we have um, fuzziness here, but I suspect that this is not the, the, this is not the case, especially if we're amending so many acts. Um, so this is one example. Um, I will not look in, in great detail on dispersion in clean air laws in Canada. Um, I, I will leave this to your, um, to your um, discretion, let's say, but I know that Liz Fisher is who is going to present in the, one of the following uh, uh, meetings is an expert in clean air law and possibly maybe also in Canadian clean air law. Anyway, what I'm saying about patchwork legislation is that in, a, in essence, we will always find um, the existence of several le legislative bodies or legislative acts or even regulations or whatever, or doctrines. Um, acting, uh, operating in a, not in a very order, orderly way. Hence, we have fuzziness. It will be very difficult to understand what the law is in such fields. It's very good for lawyers, but it's very bad for anybody involved in a clean air law, in a clean, air, clean air law, or if he's a suspected terrorist, then she must start digging into the law book, to, to the, in the law book to understand what's going on. Okay. So again, we look at legitimacy here. We see that statutes offer various ways of, uh, of being fuzzy. And as long as they are fuzzy and cannot be considered to be based on a single statute that is clear, um, then there's a problem of legitimacy. But I must return to, my, to the earlier argument about an internal tension. I'm not saying that we need to strive to create statutes that are clear, authoritative, and beyond discussion. Uh, I just don't think it's, it's a possibility because in the end there will be political forces that will lead to grants of power uh, in, in a, inconsistent ways. It's just the way it is. And there will be possibly very limited restraint on the executive for the same reasons. I will, when in, in the end, I will ask, okay, so what can we do with this kind of uh, endemic fuzziness? But of course it has an implication on, legit, on the legis, legitimacy of government, right? Now, my third generator, there's a lot of time left, right, Paul? Okay, my third uh, generator of fuzziness is the executive. I'm showing here some types of fuzziness that emerge from the executive. <coughs> some of them have been discussed, but I don't think that all in, in, in one context. So we have a lot of literature on selective enforcement. What happens when some um, transgressions are enforced and others are not? Um, what happens when uh, the enforcement is informal rather than rely on the existing sanctions in law? <laughs> the thing is, obviously when we have this kind of, these kinds of practices, um, clarity, in the way law is in, is applied is very low. Now, two uh, point two actually, oops, no, 
point two uh, is linked with the idea that we have sent certain cases in which there is a statute, okay? But beyond the statute, various parallel schemes are introduced, okay? Possibly by subsidy programs, or in the case of the United States, we know that under the constitution, international agreement or transnational agreements should be, um, should pass uh, the Senate's approval. Now, very, very few um, transnational ag agreements have passed this. Um, there is actually this term that is very well recognized, executive agreements. What did they, where did they come from? Not from the constitution. Um, the president makes a unilateral decision that signs a certain agreement and calls it an executive agreement. We could also talk about the War Powers Act in the United States, where under this act, there's a certain procedure for declaring war, which has almost never been used. Instead, there are other arrangements that are applied uh, um, and identified as legitimate. Why legitimate? Because, you know, that's the way it's done. So we, we accept it. The third I call pastiche law, which means we have a statute. The statute is in the book, is in the books, but it has never been implemented. Okay. Now, sometimes such a statute will be born due to some political pressure, but there is no real um, 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 drive to actually apply it. And I've talked about the War Powers uh, Resolution from 1973 that was the product of the pressure of, uh, uh, in, in the uh, Vietnam context, but really never really uh, used in, in a real way. Um, Okay, now again, we have, if we just look at the law books, we see that there's a statute, hey, you know, how lovely. And this is one of the most dangerous pitfalls of comparative analysis. You find the statute, you say, yay, I got that, but you have no idea that actually this statute has never been used. So that in itself creates fuzziness because you can't really understand if a law is actually applied or not. Um, the fourth example is, I don't think anybody has really looked at it in any, in, in any um, really way, real way, but it is a very common way of rulemaking by, by uh, executives. Say you have a, an authority in a statute or two to act. Let's take the example of econo economic um, um, actions um, against uh, countries or societies. Um, there is a statute that is de de dedicated to this provision, to this kind of power. A uh, but in general, you will find in this and many other uh, examples where in the recital of power, um, there will be a list of authorities. The, the best one, and it's become the most common one in executive orders in the United States is under provision X, Y, and Z and all powers granted to me in the constitution and the laws. Wonderful. I, the president, don't have to start and find who, which statute has given me the power. I have powers from the constitution, from the laws, and this is what I'm going to say. Now, in this case, you know, um, if one source will be found uh, un unsuitable, being that the fact that it has not really authorized the president to do X, then there's also the constitution and the laws, Y, Z, and B, and A. And uh, in this case, it is very difficult for us because basically the law is for us. 
more than for the executive to understand what exactly is the source of power. So again, a situation in which fuzziness is advanced. Now, we can see already oops, that, the, uh, the, come on, that there are quite a few um, ex types of fuzzy legality that we find throughout generated by the constitution, generated by the, by legislated, legislatures generated by the executive branch itself. So the question that I will ask before I conclude is, okay, if I say this is um, unavoidable, we will have a lot of fuzziness. What are we to expect? How are we going to keep some kind of balance between the, the insatiable need of the executive branch to, um, uh, to enhance its powers and the fact that we want to try and limit as much as we can abuse of power. What I argue shortly in the last chapter of my book which now then is, is, is a more normative aspect. Up to now, it was more like a, a, a depiction of a model under which a lot of different ways of fuzziness are part of reality, political reality. So what I want to argue is that it is extremely important to grant and continue to grant um, the judiciary in those systems, the power to constrain because the executive will not constrain itself. The parliament, especially in the parliamentary system will not constrain the executive. Even if we're talking about the presidential system, okay, there may be cases in which a president, a president is not supported by Congress, okay? So maybe there'll be a, a, an attempt to limit power, but we know this is a very difficult um, game which changes every two years or even less. Um, and, and it is quite impossible to assume that the political, uh, that the two other branches will be able to um, offer a sufficient trans um, sufficient restraint. I'm developing this argument about the role of the courts in a different direction in which I look at the court as a provider of participation um, to individuals who cannot have, do not have <laughs> direct access to the decision-making um, processes, but that's a completely different um, aspect that I would be happy to address if you had any questions. So the main points here are that we need legitimacy, but we need to understand that the executive branch self empowers categorically and that it can do that without being, without acting illegally, okay? Once legislation is both empowering and is not that great on constraints and is open-ended enough, then the executive can do a lot of things without being constrained. A problem, but not one that we can resolve. I Again, I am not looking for the miracle drug that will solve that problem. Um, so, and um, as I said, the internal tension here is irresolvable, is part of reality, and we have to be ready to accept it and try to see what we can do with it. So my typology was just a way of opening up the discussion to show how, how different and how pervasive these kinds of practices exist in, in, in a functioning democracy. I'm not talking about an autocracy or something of this sort. So thank you very much.
Well, thank you, uh, Professor Cohn, for uh, a wonderful uh, overview of a book which is very interesting and, and also very important. I think uh, interesting and important in shining a light on ways the uh, the executive, as you say, uh, seeks to empower itself. Uh, just one question which uh, pops into uh, my head uh, as I listen to you um, summing up uh, about the need for uh, the desirability of the courts um, taking a more muscular approach, uh, perhaps, uh, is that it was striking to me that uh, when we were talking about constitution generated um, fuzziness, um, much of the uh, you, you relied on cases. Um, cases in which the courts recognized or endorsed claims to uh, to executive power, um, uh, and even the even the Ram doctrine has, uh, in, in one form or other, been been recognized now by the the courts in the the UK. Um, uh, so, to what extent do you think we can we can trust the courts um, to play that muscular role, given that they've they've gone along with this in the past? Um, and I, I take the point about uh, legislative generated uh, fuzziness, uh, where evidently the, the legislature has uh, has gone along with it. Um, so, how much can we uh, can we trust the courts? And uh, sort of a a second question, um, while I uh, while I'm on the theme, is to the extent that two branches have contributed to the creation of fuzzy legality, the executive and the judiciary, or the executive and the legislature. Does that alleviate legitimacy concerns, given that it's not just the executive doing it all on its own, um, but it has had some assistance from another branch? That's it. Um, very important comments. I will address them both. Um, but you must understand that my, my, my ability to remember stuff has been really compromised in the past days. So I'll start with your argument that your, your question about, tell me if I'm correct in understanding that, again, apologies, um, that the courts have upheld different powers and therefore do we put too much um, ho uh, hope in the court resolving the, the okay so look i'm not saying that the courts are the own the best solution to take away all the problems of a society okay what I'm asking myself is what would be the alternative? Okay, so look, I'm not looking for, as I said, I'm look, not looking for a miracle cure. I have to sit at home and cough until I end this uh, situation. So no miracle cure for me at least. Um, yeah, but let's say we have a society in which the courts are not provided the power to intervene. Okay, now there have been cases in which a, a courts have decided in ways that um, invalidated certain uh, executive uh, practices. Um, one is, you know, you can't close steel mills um, by using emergency powers because there is a statute that gives the that authorizes a process of decision-making in an in industrial um, dispute. So this is one example in Youngstown. Um, now, of course, if there were an emergency, then we would expect less from the court, but I'm saying that um, I'm, I'm giving it a different angle for now. I'm not saying it's, um, if we allow courts to be, <coughs> more intrusive then we solve all the problems but what i'm looking at now and this is something i should be returning to is the uh, is the following argument now we all know that there are a, a group of 
democratic theories about the protection of individuals, the rule of law, and all of this under which the courts protect individuals' rights, etc. But I'm also looking at um, so-called deliberative um, the democratic theories, which emphasize the importance of deliberation and continuous discussion in, and involvement of individuals in the decision-making process. Now, of course, those who have support, um, what how they're called, the Lavalin, the Lavalin Company. Yeah, well, they don't need much because they have direct access to the prime minister and could put a, some pressure on the attorney general, et cetera. That's not the problem, you know, we're not talking about them. We're talking about the people who were not involved in making the decision of whether to prosecute the company or not. And they are not able to, in, to get to be heard by the prime minister or his people, etc. So what can they do? Of course, there are other uh, ways to do that. You know, they can go to the press. This is actually a very, very effective uh, type of action. But we want to be able to allow those people to be represented by, uh, by way of being able to um, uh, uh, challenge the decisions, government decisions they find um, problematic. And in the absence of their ability to go to court, we are left, they are left with really absolutely nothing. So <coughs> this is basically the argument. Um, I think this sort of answers your first question, but you can as well, yeah. Thanks, yeah. I, I can see that my uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Vanessa McDonnell, um, who has a, a review uh, <coughs> of your book uh, forthcoming in the, the International Journal of Constitutional Law, um, oh, which she starts by saying it's a terrific book, um, which it uh, which it certainly is, and talks uh, in detail about uh, how your your insights um, um, apply in in Canada. Um, now, uh, Vanessa's uh, Professor McDonnell's question is about. Uh, uh, current events unfolding in Israel. Uh, she notes that uh, Israel doesn't feature prominently in your book, and she's curious about how those current events either confirm your theory or introduce new considerations. She says she's particularly interested in what recent developments suggest for this proposal to entrench stronger mm -hmm. judicial review practices. What happens when the government decides it simply wants to remove these powers and has the power to do so? Okay, so there's a reason why I didn't write on Israel. There were two options here. Either I take an additional uh, system that is sort of similar in, 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 in nature or in status or whatever to Israel, because it didn't make much sense to, to United Kingdom, United States, and Israel. You know, it just doesn't make sense when you're doing a comparison. Um, and maybe that's not the best of reasons, but my advisors at OUP um, thought that, that it would not be necessary to further develop it, plus it would become a, a much longer book. So I decided to leave Israel out of it. Uh, Israel is actually very interesting because um, I'm not yet reaching the current event because there is a provision in the basic law which grants uh, the, pre the executive powers <coughs> um, residual powers. There's no other system I know of that has such an authoritative source of power to act. Um, in any field that is not um, <coughs> regulated by statute. So it could be very useful. Um, so that's one point. That's why Israel is not involved. I uh, would have loved to, but then I'd had, I'd had to find a smaller country. I don't know, Belgium, Holland, something of the sort 
to show. Okay, now looking at legitimacy <laughs> and the current events going on in Israel. Look, we are in the middle of um, regime upheaval. You know, the current government has decided to change our regime. There's a, there's a very, very well thought of a stage by stage program, okay? Which roughly follows what happened in Hungary. Um, there is um, there are very strong friendly links between the prime minister and Orban and other people who support this transformation of our regime. They are moving ahead in great speed. So the next week they are going to pass or try to pass a provision that actually grants the appointment power of judge, judges only to politicians. There's a, <coughs> a sort of reference to <coughs> justices, but <coughs> you don't need to uh, have a majority um, of all members. So you, you, you don't even have some power to influence um, basically, that's the idea. Now, this is just one part of a very general attack over any kind of vision of democracy. We are talking about a very difficult situation. I'm involved in quite a few um, uh, um, attacks or arguments, struggles against this reform. One of the aspect, one of the things that I'm doing is creating as uh, addressing uh, uh, statements from scholars and high level offices, etc., around the world. The United Kingdom is now being dis being written. So, if anybody in Canada wants to join, actually, well, you have joined to a certain extent, because there's a, a declaration or a statement made by United States academics and Canadians have joined. So um, what about legitimacy? Well, the, 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 the answer, the direct answer is who cares, which is what basically they say. Look, we have the majority. We have 64 seats out of 120. Therefore, the people voted for us, we'll do whatever we think we should do. We don't care. The idea of legitimacy is basically, we have the majority and therefore we are legitimate, stop. There's no issue, no discussion of how do we protect the, the minorities? Who cares, you know, we'll just throw them out. Um, we don't need them. So that's basically what we're working with. This is way worse than anything ever being done in Israel. We're talking about the regime upheaval. Um, and if it works, we, um, we, we will have to say goodbye to the Israeli democracy as we know it. I can't, be, I can't be optimistic. It's like a nightmare. The only problem is you can't really wake up. It's just the way it is. So, uh, I don't know, it's bad. Well, on that uh, uh, sobering, that. sobering note, uh, we leave, uh, we, we leave Israel. And I'm just, um, uh, if you don't mind, um, have you, uh, have you answer one more question um, um, posed by one of my students, uh, Ephraim Bar Barrera. Um, Accepting that executive actors can make decisions in unavoidable realms of legal fuzziness that contribute to that fuzziness, should part of the solution include encouraging certain values in the culture of the executive branch? More specifically, do you think that the solution should include ways to cultivate the value of the executive clearly identifying the legal basis of an executive action and I, I should say that uh, in Vanessa McDonnell's review of your book uh, she uh, uh, goes in this direction as well. Just about <coughs> well there is a sort of a tradition in this way if anybody challenges gov a governmental action 
then the government, again, in court, you know, where else would it be challenged? Um, there is a need to cite the source of authority. So yes, but if you don't have a, a specific source of authority, then you have sufficient basis in different doctrines that have been accepted. And um, therefore, that would be the first step. It would always be the first step. Find me the source of legality. But when a source of legality is also, you know, the constitution at large in the United States, the take care clause, everything, or uh, well, you know, um, third source powers, there's no pro prohibition on action, then, then therefore it should be allowed. Um, this would be stage step two. Step two would often enable the action, not always. Our best, um, our best bet would be on action that directly uh, breaches a protected human rights. Then we know under the principle of legality that you have to have some expressly legislated authority to act in a way that breaches human rights, okay? But, you know, this principle of legality has been recently diluted and not only in Israel. So even a, generally author, a general authorization rather than a specific authorization may suffice. Um, but of course, this is an important element of constitutional law as we know it. Will this be sufficient in, in minimizing um, excessive use of power? I'm not sure. It also re, it's also very important. Setting, I have nothing bad to say about protecting human rights, but think about irresolvable policy decisions. You decide on a, a reform of land. Now this is irreducible. You know, once you have decided that the land is going to be given to A, B, and C, that's it basically. So reforms, general reforms that have little directly to do with, uh, with individual rights are just as important um, in, in that they should be protected as much as possible. Um, otherwise, okay, so individual rights will be protected, but um, you know, if we privatize the whole of the government and you know, we no longer have um, um, social security, etc. That has a lot to. That's got a lot of implications on the health of a society, which again has to be taken into account. Sorry, I wanted to be optimistic, but it's not the day. No, well, um, you know, um, people can. Uh, well, I mean, there is an optimistic note, and as much as uh, the judicial review process uh, can be uh, can be strengthened in some ways to uh, to remedy uh, some of the uh, some of the defects that uh, that you've identified. So uh, it's not a case of abandoning hope. Uh, all ye who enter here, there is uh, there there is always hope. Um, I'd like to thank you, um, Professor Cohn, for um, a wonderful presentation and for being such a good sport uh, with the questions. Um, notwithstanding uh, your recovery from uh, from the flu, uh, which we all hope uh, continues apace and uh, allows you to continue on your your travels around Europe uh, to spread uh, your knowledge, uh, your considerable knowledge and wisdom. Um, so thank you again for helping us to kick off uh, this year's colloquium. We'll be back uh, in uh, in two weeks uh, with the uh, the next event with uh, Professor Fisher, whom you mentioned, um, and Professor Shapiro to talk about administrative agencies. So uh, until then, uh, thank you all for your attention today, and I look forward to seeing you next time out. And thanks most of all to Professor Cohn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. All the Have best. Have a nice evening. Oh, no, it's lunchtime for you. <laughs> yeah. Have a good day. Bye now. Okay, bye.